On May 28, 1946, a patent was filed in the name of two scientists, both of whom would become very famous, but for different reasons. Oddly, the patent filed here in the United States can't be seen here. It's part of a category of patents that were filed and kept in secret, but it has been released in full in Russia. It's part of a story of two brilliant scientists who had very different ideas of the greatest scientific program perhaps in all of history, and in a notorious case of Cold War espionage. Patent number S-5292X, Improvements in Method and Means for Utilizing Nuclear Energy, by John von Neumann and Klaus Fuchs, deserves to be remembered. Noted science historian Alex Weatherstein of New Jersey's Stevens Institute wrote about a peculiar contradiction in a 2008 edition of the science history journal ISIS. No technology in the 20th century has been as intertwined with the policies of secrecy as nuclear weapons. In the United States, these weapons have always been manufactured by government monopoly, and the specific information about their manufacture has long been the target of policies, meant to cloister that information within the highest levels of classification. The American patent system, on the other hand, has long been regarded as a tool of legal openness. The inventor is granted a temporary monopoly on the production of an invention in return for disclosing how it works. Wellerstein is pointing out something not generally known about the Manhattan Project. While one of the most secret programs in history was being developed, the U.S. government was seeking to preserve both secrecy and a monopoly on that technology via the U.S. patent system. Something that Wellerstein observes is not, from the present point of view, an obvious choice for dealing with nuclear secrets. In fact, he notes, the government filed not one, but thousands of patents regarding technological aspects of the development of nuclear weapons, all filed in secret. David Kestenbaum explains on National Public Radio. The U.S. atomic bomb was such a secret, scientists and engineers sometimes talked in code. It was the Manhattan Project, not the atomic bomb project. Plutonium was referred to as copper, and the bomb itself as the gadget. But at the same time, scientists and engineers were furiously filing secret patent applications that described many of the parts in exquisite detail. These patents sat not behind the fences at Los Alamos, but in a vault at the U.S. Patent Office. The idea seems, well, bizarre. And Wellerstein credulously asked, was the U.S. government going to sue the Soviets for infringement if they developed their own bomb? Perhaps demand royalties? The idea came as a surprise to Congress. Wellerstein relates a February 1946 exchange between Captain Robert A. Lavender, the officer in charge of the patent program, and Connecticut Senator Brian McMahon, chairman of the Select Special Committee on Atomic Energy. McMahon, now, are there any patent applications covering the making of the bomb? Captain Lavender, yes. The chairman, I wonder, what is the necessity for covering the bomb itself by applications for patents? I didn't dream, frankly, up until this point, McMahon said, addressing a fellow senator and committee member, that there was a patent application down there showing how the bomb was put together. Did you? No, the other senator replied. Personally, I regret it. Kestenbaum writes, there were worries that if scientists working on the project owned the patents, they might use them to try to control how their inventions were used. There was also this concern that some private inventor or scientist abroad might patent something first, potentially causing trouble down the road. Wellerstein concludes that in many ways the patenting program was an ad hoc adaptation of contract policy and intellectual property practices to address a changing menagerie of threats. Whether they were accusations of profiteering, challenges by project scientists over ownership of their work, or French scientists looking to secure post-war information sharing deals. The system prevented individual scientists within the program, as well as private inventors or foreign entities, from claiming rights or demanding control of the technology. McMahon's answer in the Atomic Energy Act, signed into law in August 1946, was to ban patents on nuclear weapons altogether, under 42 U.S. Code, subsection 218. No patent shall hereafter be granted for any invention or discovery which is useful solely in the utilization of special nuclear material or atomic energy in an atomic weapon. Rather than the patent system, the government would control the spread of nuclear weapons via government control and secrecy. But Wellerstein notes another oddity. While the Manhattan Project has been the subject of extensive historical inquiry, the patent program, which was not only very large but supported at all levels up to General Groves and President Roosevelt, the existence of such a program is barely mentioned in secondary historical literature. Wellerstein attributes this lack of attention to the conceptual contradiction at the heart of the program, 
the deliberate placement of military technical secrets into a system of legal openness. The little-known program is interesting historically for many reasons, but one reason has to do with one of the last patents filed, Patent S-5292X. John von Neumann is widely described as one of the smartest people in history. The Lemelson MIT program, a grant institution that supports invention education, writes of him, Born in Budapest, Hungary in 1903, as a very young child, he impressed the people around him with his incredible memory. It was said that he could memorize pages of the phone book and divide eight digit numbers in his head by the age of six. In 1930, he was invited to come to the United States to teach at Princeton University, an offer that made sense given what was going on in Europe at the time. New Jersey's Institute for Advanced Study, where von Neumann was a professor along with Albert Einstein, explains that von Neumann was one of a group of Hungarian and Jewish intellectuals to escape to the United States from the turmoil of Europe. Von Neumann contributed to many fields, from fluid dynamics and quantum mechanics to games theory, and is perhaps best known for conceiving the stored program computer, now known as the von Neumann architecture, that is the foundation of most modern computers. Hans Bethe, himself a Nobel laureate, said of him, I have sometimes wondered whether a brain like von Neumann's does not indicate a species superior to that of man. It was his expertise in mathematical modeling of explosions, particularly shock waves, and his work on shaped charges for the U.S. Navy that prompted J. Robert Oppenheimer to invite von Neumann to work on the Manhattan Project in 1943. There he played a critical role in the development of the atomic bomb. The Atomic Heritage Foundation explains, he joined the Manhattan Project in 1943, working on the immense number of calculations needed to build the atomic bomb. He showed that the implosion design, which would later be used in the Trinity and Fat Man bombs, was likely faster and more efficient than the gun design. Von Neumann's principal contribution to the project was the concept and design of the explosive lenses used in the implosion bombs. Yet he developed a different interest after the war. The Atomic Heritage Foundation writes, After the Manhattan Project, von Neumann worked to solve problems related to the development of the hydrogen bomb. Theoretical physicist Jerry Bernstein explains in a 2010 edition of Physics in Perspective. The first question we want to answer is why are fusion bombs so powerful as compared to fission bombs? The most energetic fusion reaction known involving hydrogen isotopes is the fusing of a deuteron and a triton to produce a stable isotope of helium plus a neutron. This reaction generates something like a tenth of the energy of a typical fission reaction. Hence the puzzle. The answer is that the mass of the deuteron and triton is about a fiftieth of the mass of, say, uranium. Hence a gram of uranium contains about a fiftieth of the atoms compared to a gram of deutrons and tritons. This compensates for the difference in energy. You get more energy per gram in fusion than you get in fission because there are more nuclei. Bernstein explains that the original idea for a thermonuclear, then called a classic super, was conceived in 1941 during a discussion by legendary physicists Enrico Fermi and Edward Teller. Teller then involved Hans Bethe in 1942. Bethe later said, Well, the whole thing was far more difficult than we thought then. We encountered one difficulty after another and came up with one solution after another, but the difficulties were clearly in the majority. The difficulty had to do with ignition. Early hydrogen bomb designs struggled with initiating the fusion reaction efficiently. They needed a large amount of tritium, and the ignition did not propagate effectively. In an effort to solve the problem, von Neumann worked with a theoretical physicist named Klaus Fuchs. Born in the German Empire on December 29, 1911, Fuchs studied mathematics and physics at the University of Leipzig, where his father taught theology. He fled Germany for England after the Nazis came to power, where he earned his Ph.D. from the University of Bristol. In late 1943, Fuchs was sent to the United States as part of a British delegation of scientists, sent to work on the Manhattan Project. Moved from Columbia University to Los Alamos, he worked on developing the gaseous diffusion method of uranium enrichment. Bernstein says of him, at Los Alamos, he was very well liked. Since he was non-social, he volunteered to act as a babysitter for his more sociable colleagues who wanted to attend the many parties. Beta said that Fuchs was one of the most valuable men in my division and one of the best theoretical physicists we had. And Bernstein notes he was extremely competent and had almost photographic memory. Next to Oppenheimer, he may have known more about all the activities of the laboratory than anyone. It isn't clear how von Neumann and Fuchs came to work together on the solution to the ignition problem on the classical super. Bernstein writes, who started it and who contributed what? There are very few clues. But he notes that on the patent design, the two would eventually file that von Neumann is listed first, which presumably means that he instigated the collaboration.
While it's still not clear exactly who contributed what to the design, it represents an important step. Physicist German A. Goncharov, who worked on the Soviet nuclear program, wrote in 1998, In the spring of 1946, as work was proceeding on the classical super, a new invention came to light, one that would later be appreciated as an invention of utmost significance. Klaus Fuchs, with the collaboration of John von Neumann, proposed the application of a new initiation system in the classical super. The von Neumann-Fuchs design used radiation implosion for ignition. Gontrav writes, Fuchs' proposal, truly remarkable in the wealth of ideas that it embodied, was far ahead of its time in the possibilities afforded by the mathematical modeling of the most complex physical processes, without which any future elaboration of these ideas would be impossible. It would take another five years in the United States for the enormous conceptual potential of Fuchs' proposal, itself the outgrowth of a proposal by von Neumann, to be fully substantiated. But why was a Russian explaining the American design for a trigger for a hydrogen bomb? The answer has to do with the patent that was filed as part of the Manhattan Project patent program and its authors, whose enigmatic collaboration came despite a significant political difference between the two. Von Neumann had experienced the short-lived Hungarian Soviet Republic in 1919. The government was really a rump state that controlled around a quarter of the territory of Hungary and included a period of repressive violence called the Red Terror. It is little wonder that von Neumann described himself as being, quote, violently anti-communist and much more militaristic than the norm. In an interview in 1950, he said, If you say, why not bomb the Russians tomorrow, I say, why not bomb them today? If you say today at five o'clock, I say, why not one o'clock? It was his commitment to a nuclear deterrent that largely spurred his interest in developing the H-bomb, and his commitment to the U.S. nuclear deterrent continued. In 1998, the Financial Times wrote, There is no doubt of his commitment to a strong U.S. nuclear force. He chaired the ICBM committee, which persuaded President Eisenhower to launch the missile race, and was a full-time member of the Atomic Energy Commission, which was responsible for the nuclear weapons that would sit on the rockets. That position contrasted sharply with Fuchs, who in 1930 had joined the German Communist Party. The reason that he fled Germany was because communists were being repressed after the Nazi rise to power, and his support did not end there. The website of the Manhattan Project National Historical Site explains, Although Klaus Emil Julius Fuchs was a very talented theoretical physicist and was responsible for many significant theoretical calculations relating to nuclear and hydrogen weapons at the Los Alamos Laboratory, it was not science for which he is most remembered during and after the Manhattan Project. It was espionage. The Atomic Heritage Foundation writes, Fuchs became a British citizen in August 1942 and subsequently signed the Official Secrets Act, pledging not to pass state secrets related to national security and defense to foreign governments. Yet still sympathetic to the communist cause, Fuchs shortly thereafter began providing Soviet GRU operatives with classified information on the progress of Britain's atomic research and development project. Bernstein writes, he was constantly transmitting this information to the Russians. It's possible that he conducted the espionage simply out of sympathy for Soviet ideology, although some have suggested that he did so after Germany invaded Russia and he felt that the Russians needed to develop a bomb to defend themselves. Two, he also seemed to believe in scientific openness and the principle that science should be shared. But in any case, his espionage was significant. Former CIA director Alan Dulles wrote in his 1968 book, True Spy Stories, It's hard to find anything great or admirable in the person of Klaus Fuchs, but the result of his betrayal of our nuclear secrets to the Soviets may have changed the course of history. The Atomic Energy Project explains, Some experts estimate that Fuchs' intelligence enabled the Soviets to develop and test their own atomic bomb one to two years earlier than otherwise expected. How did these two scientists with such divergent views come to work together? Wellerstein writes, So on the face of it, it's an improbable matchup, the Soviet spy and the anti-communist human computer. Of course, viewed in context, it's not so improbable. They were both talented physicists, both worked at Los Alamos, and nobody at the lab knew that Fuchs was a spy. Fuchs was arrested in Britain in 1949 and convicted in 1950. The website Spyscape writes, He leaked every secret he knew to the KGB and may well have remained under the radar if the Allies hadn't broken the Soviet codes. Fuchs' contribution to the Soviet development of a fission bomb is clear, but the effect of his espionage on the Soviet development of a thermonuclear device is less clear. Wellerstein explains, One of the most enigmatic documents in early Cold War nuclear history is the so-called Fuchs von Neumann Patent. It was Los Alamos Secret Patent Application Number S-5292X. Improvements in Method and Means for Utilizing Nuclear Energy. It is mentioned cryptically, often with heavy redaction in many official histories of the hydrogen bomb. 
The patent is interesting to historians because it allegedly plays a key role in answering the question of whether the Soviets got the H-bomb through espionage or by their own hard work. We know that Fuchs passed it on to the Soviets. And the question is, what did it contain, and how did the Soviets use it? Goncharov writes that Fuchs first passed on information on the H-bomb in 1947. In London, on 28 September 1947, Fuchs met with the Soviet intelligence agent Alexander S. Peskilsov. Peskilsov asked Fuchs ten questions, the first considering the super bomb. From the report of this meeting, we know that Fuchs orally communicated the reality of ongoing theoretical super bomb studies in the United States. In 1948, he passed on the plans of the fusion bomb, conveniently provided in concise form by the patent application that he and von Neumann had filed on May 28, 1946. Gontrov writes, on 13 March 1948, an event took place that played an exceptional role in the subsequent course of the Soviet thermonuclear bomb program. On that day, Fuchs and Besklasov met a second time in London, and the British scientists handed over materials of paramount importance. Included in the documents was new theoretical information pertinent to the superbomb. But did the Soviets derive their bomb from the von Neumann-Fuchs model? Wellerstein writes, the patent is allegedly one of the first suggestions of the concept of radiation implosion, that is, using the radiation output of a fission bomb as a means of initiating fusion. In 1951, this would become one of the central components of the so-called teller ulam design of the hydrogen bomb, on which all subsequent hydrogen bombs were based. But both Wellenstein and Bernstein come to a similar conclusion. The Fuchs von Neumann approach would have helped the Soviets very much in terms of arriving at the teller ulam design, Wellenstein explains. The bigger issue on the road to the teller ulam design was not so much the idea that radiation could be used to transmit energy or even to implode the secondary, but getting away from the classical super notion of starting a small reaction that would then propagate onward. The patent filed 99 years ago today is interesting for a number of reasons. It's part of the little-known Manhattan Project patent program. It was created by two scientists that were both brilliant and neither one who, it seems, should have been working together. And it was, of course, a key part of one of the most notorious cases of Cold War espionage. But did it give the Soviets the H-bomb? Well, Wellerstein argues that its larger effect was probably in convincing the Soviets that one was possible. He writes, It didn't give the Soviets the right idea on how to build an H-bomb, but it did seem to convince them that the Americans were taking the project very seriously and were making some progress, and that they should start their own dedicated H-bomb project as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.